Hello and welcome to what I think will be a fairly unique episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're going to talk about one of my favorite Supreme Court cases, certainly one of the ones that is most memorable to me. And if you found yourself here by searching Wickard v. Filburn, congratulations, you're very likely a law school student, and I hope your 1L year is going well, even though it's probably being done remotely right now, and that can't be fun, so I have a lot of sympathy for all you first-year law students. But Wickard v. Filburn is a very, very, very important case in United States jurisprudence, and I actually wound up discussing this very briefly in a video I did last week or a little bit before then about whether or not the federal government could hold that people that are doing all of these kind of coronavirus prank videos are bioterrorists. And in that video, I pointed out one of the things that is pretty prominent if you look at any kind of United States statutes for a long period of time, and that is that this particular set of statutes about weapons of mass destruction have all of these constitutional hooks to the notions of interstate or foreign commerce, that you can't do bad things, that you will be violating this particular statute that I was discussing in this video, you will be violating it if what you did involved interstate or foreign commerce. And I had a number of people after I did this video and I kind of briefly described Wickard v. Filburn, the case we're going to talk about today, that said that can't possibly be right, that can't be what was decided, that anything that affects commerce, whether or not it's on your own property, actually constitutes commerce for purposes of the Constitution. And I had people ask me about it, and I said, yeah, it does. And Wickard v. Filburn is one of the reasons why so many federal statutes that exist since Wickard v. Filburn was decided in the 40s would not have been contemplated as within the purview of the United States federal government before that case. And so I want to talk about that case with you today. I think it's a very important one. I think we can talk a lot about Supreme Court cases of import, hopefully do it on a fairly svelte basis that is informative, educational, and fun. And while I think there's enough bad news out there right now to choke a horse, I I'm going to warn you that if you have any kind of sensitivity towards federal empowerment, how the Constitution is written, what Congress should be permitted to do and what it shouldn't be permitted to do, this case is probably going to frustrate you immensely. This is called terrible Supreme Court decisions for a reason. And Wickard v. Filburn stands at the head of the class as long as you're only talking about domestic economics in the United States. God knows there are plenty of bad Supreme Court decisions that relate to a whole bunch of other things that are potentially more problematic than just economic regulation. But Wickard v. Filburn has the most lasting effect. It is the one that has transformed the United States government and how it operates, particularly Congress, the most. So without further ado, without setting the table and the groundwork any further, let's dive into this case. You see here it's Wickard v. Filburn. Wickard, in this case, is actually the Secretary of Agriculture, Claude Wickard, man of power against the absolutely appropriately named wheat farmer Roscoe C. Filburn. And I just love the names in this case because it fits so well with what you might otherwise be thinking of as these two parties. So Wickard is the Secretary of Agriculture, and he's going to be enforcing a law against wheat farmer Roscoe Filburn. Let's take a look at what that law actually is, how this got set up, what the case facts are. It says the appellee, That is Mr. Filburn. That is the farmer. When you see Appelli here, it's who has appealed the decision in the lower court, and that's the farmer. It says the Appelli for many years past has owned and operated a small farm in Montgomery County, Ohio, maintaining a herd of dairy cattle, selling milk, raising poultry, and selling poultry and eggs. It has been his practice to raise a small acreage of winter wheat sown in the fall and harvested in the following July, to sell a portion of the crop, to feed part to poultry and livestock on the farm, some of which is sold, to use some in making flour for home consumption, and to keep the rest for the following seeding. So that's the lay of the land. You've got a farmer in Ohio, primarily focused on dairy cattle and poultry, but that also sows some wheat to feed that poultry, to feed that cattle, Other livestock is mentioned here. Some to make bread at home and some to sell. 
the intended disposition of the crop here involved, the one that we're discussing in this case, was not expressly stated, but the parties have stipulated to these facts that the farmer does these things. In July of 1940, pursuant to the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938, as then amended, there were established for the Appellee's 1941 crop a wheat acreage allotment of 11.1 acres and a normal yield of 20.1 bushels of wheat an acre. So this act is a federal act and it limits the ability of wheat farmers in 1941 to specific amounts of their land that they can apportion to the harvesting of wheat and then what the yield of that wheat can be on that land. However, Appellee, Roscoe, Mr. Filburn, sowed 23 acres and harvested from his 11.9 acres of excess acreage an additional 239 bushels, which under the terms of the act as amended constituted farm marketing excess subject to a penalty of 49 cents a bushel or $117 in all. Might not sound like a lot, but remember this is 1942. So that's actually a significant amount of money, especially for a wheat farmer who doesn't feel like this law should at all apply to him. But we've got now the lay of the land. He sows wheat, some of which is sold, some of which he feeds to his livestock, some of which he eats himself. And in this particular case, he was told he could only sow 11 acres. He instead sowed 23. Now we get into a few bits of discussion here about what this act does. I'm going to skip a lot of the specifics because this act obviously isn't pertinent to you all today, but it was designed to control prices. It was designed to control a very fluid wheat market environment by limiting the ability of specific farmers to farm wheat. It says the general scheme of the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938 as related to wheat is to control the volume moving in interstate and foreign Commerce. That's the first time we see that reference here. And I think now is a useful time to go and look at the Constitution. So if you aren't a United States citizen, you don't remember civics class, what have you, it's important to note that the way the U.S. federal government is set up is one of enumerated powers. Unlike some other constitutions from some other jurisdictions, this specific Constitution says what you can do. And basically, we're not going to go into it in this video, reserves what it doesn't give to a specific federal authority, either to the states or to the people living in those states, which are their own dead letters under constitutional law. But we'll get into that maybe in another video. Right now, what I want to focus on is that Congress has these specific powers in Section 8 to do these various things, to borrow money, to coin money, to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting, to establish post offices, to promote the progress of science and useful arts. We've talked about that in virtual legality a lot because we talk about copyright and intellectual property. But the most important power that they have, not here in the Constitution, but after Wickard v. Filburn, what it became is the power of Congress to regulate commerce with foreign nations, sure, but among the several states. Remember that. Congress has the official fully black letter constitutional authority to regulate commerce among the states. That is going to be the focal point of this entire case. Proceeding on, we skip a little bit of a discussion about what the Secretary of Agriculture did here, whether or not their speech was effective to change some of the penalties and things along those lines. That isn't very important to why Wickard v. Filburn is such a landmark case in United States law. Section two is that importance. So let's dive in. It is urged that under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, Article one, Section eight, Clause three, Article one, Section eight, Clause three, what we just looked at to regulate commerce among the several states is within Congress's authority. That Congress does not possess the power it has in this instance sought to exercise. The question would merit little consideration, this court says, because we've done a lot of Commerce Clause cases and we know the federal government is allowed to regulate production. It says the, co- the question would merit little consideration since our decision in Darby sustaining the federal power to regulate production of goods for commerce, except for the fact that this act extends federal regulation to production not intended in any part for commerce but wholly for consumption on the farm. Now, here's where I give the spoiler alert. 
And I think this spoiler alert is important because as we read this, it's going to become more and more kind of important. The U.S. Supreme Court here is going to decide unanimously against the farmer. And they're going to decide against the farmer under the auspices that Congress does have the authority to regulate under the Commerce Clause wheat farmed by this farmer wholly for his own consumption. Saying again, the Constitution says Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce. Commerce being the buying and selling of goods and to regulate that. The farmer here, his argument is that, hey, okay, maybe that should apply to what I sell. Maybe we could even have a discussion about that applying to what I put into livestock that I sell. But heck, if I'm making bread for myself, if I'm keeping it to sow later, how does that how does that relate to the regulation of interstate commerce? I'm obviously within my own state. I'm on my own farm. What are you talking about? And the court initially acknowledges that problem, it says we wouldn't even have to discuss this if this were just production of goods in commerce. We know that under our prior, prior cases that this is allowed, that the Congress can regulate those things. But here we're trying to extend it to wheat that is wholly consumed by the farmer himself. Penalties under the act do not depend on whether any part of the wheat, either within or without the quota, is sold or intended to be sold. The sum of this is that the federal government fixes a quota, including all that the farmer may harvest for sale or for his own farm needs, and declares that wheat produced on excess acreage may neither be disposed of nor used except upon payment of a penalty. The appellee, the farmer, says that this is a regulation of the production and consumption of wheat. Now, you'll see this language here used. Production, consumption, direct, indirect, that was all gotten rid of basically in this case. So you won't, if you go and you follow this on, if you see people that are citing Wickard v. Filburn as late as 2012, uh, I, I think, and probably even later, but at the Supreme Court level, they were definitely talking about it with respect to the Affordable Care Act, that... This language is important. You always see essentially the prior precedents referenced in the appellee's case at the Supreme Court level, but the court's going to kick that all out because they say it's not important. Such activities are, the farmer urges, beyond the reach of congressional power under the Commerce Clause since they are local in character and their effects upon interstate commerce are at most indirect. And we're going to see some of the logic of the court here that suggests that that indirectness doesn't matter, that the regulation of interstate commerce can reach all of these things. And we're going to see it writ large in just a moment. First, they're going to talk about a case that this Supreme Court actually decided earlier that year in 1942, which is going to set the groundwork for why you are going to see how Wickard v. Filburn is actually decided. And we're also going to talk about why this particular case isn't the one that everybody talks about, isn't the one that's cited so often, not as often as Wickard v. Filburn says the present chief justice of the court has said in summary of the present state of the law. I've highlighted this in yellow because you're going to like this. The commerce power is not confined in its exercise to the regulation of commerce among the states. We got to read that one again. The commerce power, the one specifically articulated in Article One of the Constitution, is not confined in its exercise to the regulation of commerce among the states. Section 8, Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce among the states. The Supreme Court of the United States in 1942, before this case, in a case called United States versus Wrightwood Dairy Company, actually has as part of its decision the statement that the commerce power is not confined to the exercise of the regulation of commerce among the states. You know you're in for a good decision when that's your premise. The 1942 court was very interested in in advancing the federal decision-making process to allow for really all of what would become the, the New Deal. And so this is the first of those kinds of cases that really advances this, Wickard v. Filburn, to all sorts of activities. The reason that Wrightwood Dairy Company isn't as uh, kind of thought of, isn't as cited as widely as Wickard v. Filburn, is because this particular case relates directly to commerce. So in this particular case, you've got milk that's sold in Illinois by Illinois dairy farmers to somebody that's distributing that milk. But at bare minimum, there's commercial activity there. 
there is the selling and buying of milk. And the argument in that case is similar to Wicker v. Filburn, as we will see, that says, hey, if you're buying and selling milk in Illinois, you're not buying and selling it from New York. And so that affects whether or not you would buy or sell it from New York or any other state. And so the prices are altered. And because of that, we can regulate your buying and selling within your own state. We can cover intrastate activity. Now, that's its own problem. That is completely separate from Wickard v. Filburn, as we will see, because this advances that ball way down the field from even there. But you can see how the reasoning in something like Wrightwood Dairy Company results in a decision like Wickard v. Filburn. Just one last time, the commerce power is not confined to the regulation of commerce among the states. Oh boy. As you can see highlighted in blue, he also extends it. He says it extends to those activities intrastate, inside one state, which so affect interstate commerce or the exertion of the power of Congress over it as to make regulation of them appropriate. In other words, what we're going to get into is Congress in the Constitution has the black letter right to regulate interstate commerce. And so why wouldn't it also have the related right to regulate those things which affect interstate commerce? And this was the first case, right, with Dairy Company that really talks about that at length. And then you see that become more and more attenuated until just later in the same year here in the end of 1942, you get a decision like this one. Even if Apelli's activity be local, and though it may not be regarded as commerce, it may still, whatever its nature, be reached by Congress if it exerts a substantial economic effect on interstate commerce. You say, Rick, okay, break that down. The first thing that's very important in Wickard v. Filburn is that the activity doesn't need to be commercial at all. This case stands for the prop, uh, the proposition that the Congress can reach any activity in America if they can frame the case as one that affects interstate commerce. And I got news for you. Basically, anything that you do or don't do affects interstate commerce. The reason that this wound up coming up in the Affordable Care Act cases was that the question became, all right, if you're forcing somebody to buy health care insurance, is that something that you can control if it's within one state? Is it something that you can mandate if somebody never would have moved in state uh, across state lines? All of these questions pop up and Wickard says, hey, if anything that you would do or don't do, if you would refuse to buy that health care insurance, if you would refuse to shop at the grocery market, if you would refuse to not do something commercial, if you would refuse to walk your dog, then you don't walk your dog, you don't need a leash, that leash could have been bought in Massachusetts, can we then regulate whether or not and how often and when you can walk your dog? Obviously, that's a ridiculous kind of reductio ad absurdum type argument, but it is the kind of argument that this line of thinking would result in for the federal government for at least 50 years. So it's 1942 when Wickard v. Filburn gets decided. It's not until the 1990s in the famous Lopez gun decision that the United States Supreme Court would overturn any assertion of the federal government that whatever they were passing was permitted under the regulation of interstate commerce clause. The Supreme Court had set the groundwork so strongly in this case that even now it is very, very rare for any of these kind of constitutional hooks that reference interstate commerce to fail, to fall under judicial scrutiny and for the justices to throw it out. And that makes the Constitution and the congressional limits on power something of a dead letter. Because if you can just affix interstate commerce to your statute, and then if it doesn't matter whether or not what you are actually regulating relates directly to interstate commerce, if you can make the argument that it could affect it sometime in the future, then that means that your Congress, your legislative branch, isn't a branch of limited powers anymore. And indeed, they've acted that way for a good long time now. Even if a Pelley's activity is local, and even if it's not commerce, if it affects a substantial economic effect on interstate commerce, then it's still regulatable. Now you say, okay, 
That's bad, maybe. Maybe you agree with it entirely, and that's fine, too. And we can talk about that at the end of this video, about how there might be ways to adjust the Constitution to get where you want to go with this kind of stuff that doesn't require torturing Article 1 to within an inch of its life. But maybe you say, okay, substantial economic effect sounds good, right? Does Roscoe Filburn actually substantially affect interstate commerce by making flour in his kitchen? Hang on, because the court's going to tell you that that doesn't matter. The maintenance by government regulation of a price for wheat undoubtedly can be accomplished as effectively by sustaining or increasing the demand as by limiting the supply. The effect of the statute before us is to restrict the amount which may be produced for market and the extent as well to which one may forestall resort to the market by producing to meet his own needs. So again, the logic in this particular case is if Roscoe hadn't actually sown his own wheat and made his own flour or provided it to his livestock, he would have had to go get that wheat from somewhere. And because he would have had to go get that wheat from somewhere, that would have required buying it from somewhere. Buying it from somewhere would have affected at least prices within his own state. And under that dairy case, even if you're only buying stuff produced for you in your own state, for use in your own state, that affects interstate commerce because, hey, you could have bought it across state lines. And because you didn't, that changes the price across state lines. And so even sowing wheat for making your own bread affects interstate commerce because, hey, you didn't buy that bread and you could have. That Apelli's own contribution to the demand for wheat may be trivial by itself is not enough to remove him from the scope of federal regulation, whereas here his contribution, taken together with that of many others similarly situated, is far from trivial. Remember when we just talked about substantial economic effect? Well, the court says, yeah, the effect has to be substantial, but it doesn't have to be your effect. We can aggregate everybody that falls under the ambit of this statute. In this particular case, wheat farmers or anybody not farming wheat right? The alternative of this is, okay, well, I don't farm wheat right now. That affects the price of wheat. That affects your ability to license wheat. That affects all these kinds of things. Can you regulate me? Can you make me make wheat? It's hard to say. But most importantly, from what we just talked about, substantial economic effect is no barrier to any of this because the court immediately throws it out. Because I tell you what, if you pass a federal statute that applies to the entire United States, the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest effect is going to be aggregated across the citizenry and you're never not going to meet a substantial effect barrier, which is what this case ultimately wound up doing. One of the primary purposes of the act in question was to increase the market price of wheat and to that end, to limit the volume thereof that could affect the market, even if not intended for commercial use, even if you're going to eat it yourself. It can hardly be denied that a factor of such volume and variability as home-consumed wheat would have a substantial influence on price and market conditions. Thus, we find it within the power of Congress to regulate that home consumption of what you grew for yourself. That is the holding of Wickard v. Filburn. Or as it's described here in Justia, an activity does not need to have a direct effect on interstate commerce to fall within the commerce power as long as the effect is substantial and economic, which doesn't do nearly enough justice to what this says. This actually, the primary holding of this case is an activity does not need to be commercial to be considered part of commerce. It does not need to have a direct effect, does not even have to have a substantiated effect, can barely have an indirect effect on interstate commerce for any one farmer named Roscoe in Ohio. And as long as the effect is substantial, when aggregated among everyone that falls under the statute's parameters and economic, it will be allowed under congressional authority. I'll tell you this right now, it is very difficult for almost anything that the United States Congress would want to do to not fall under the rules of Wickard v. Filburn. And you know, maybe that's okay with you. Maybe you sit back and you say, well, this enumerated list of rules to govern what Congress can do, it didn't contemplate our modern age. It really should be adjusted and 
we understand why the court wanted to allow these things because to otherwise limit Congress would be to tie their hands. They couldn't do these things. We think that wheat price structuring is useful for the country and Congress wouldn't be allowed to do that. And wouldn't that be a bad thing? And to that, I say, okay, I am not making this video to disagree with you on economic policy to figure out whether the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938 is a legitimate exertion of federal power. What I am want to talk about is whether or not it's constitutional. And I will advocate now for what I always advocate. The Constitution was not descended down from on high. It is not wholly writ. It is not magical. It was written by human beings. There are many, many, many areas in the Constitution which can be made better. And there's a process in the Constitution for making them better. That's how we get amendments to the Constitution. And so my view on this is and always will be, yes, address the issues with the Constitution. If Congress needs additional power, by all means, amend the Constitution, advocate for that amendment, but don't, don't, don't have a court rely on a sentence like the commerce power is not confined in its exercise to the regulation of commerce among the states when the exact opposite is staring you in the face. If you think this needs correction, if you want to cover indirect activities, if you want to describe home consumption and these kinds of things, then write them into the Constitution. You say, Rick, that's hard. We got to get the states to sign off on that. We got to get Congress to sign off on that. We have a lot of stakeholders that need to sign off on that. And I say, yes, it's designed to be hard because terrible Supreme Court decisions are primarily terrible because well-meaning, well-thinking justices in robes, unelected, have decided that the Constitution should be broadened, should mean something different from what it says on its face. And that's how you get terrible decisions. It's not because they're trying to be evil. It's not because they're trying to necessarily usurp power. It's because they think that there's a problem they've identified, that Congress has identified, and they're not so terribly inclined to disagree with the overall cure that has been prescribed for whatever the name disease is. And you wind up with tortured decision making that says to regulate commerce among the several states doesn't mean to regulate commerce among the several states. And unfortunately, the end result is a congressional power that is unmoored from constitutional limitations and Congress passing laws and statutes that affect people without any given authority to do so because everything and anything anywhere can be deemed to affect commerce. My making this video affects commerce. You're sitting there and listening to it affects commerce because you could have been watching Hulu and that would have cost you $12 a month. Or you could have been buying a video game. Or you could have said, hey, I need to go outside. I'm in quarantine. I want to play basketball. My basketball doesn't have enough air in it. It needs a pump. And instead of listening to virtual legality, you would have bought a pump on Amazon. Now, it might have gotten to you in May. God only knows whether that's essential or not. But... You would have bought a pump. It would have traveled in interstate commerce. And does that mean that Congress can then either prohibit you from or mandate that you listen to Hogue on virtual legality? Wickard v. Filburn doesn't prescribe a lot of limitations to the congressional power under its ability to regulate commerce. And that has been borne out now for some 80 years. And that's what makes it one of the most terrible Supreme Court decisions in United States history. That is the wrong button entirely. So we're going to we're going to skip talking to you about Hogue law and virtual legality in general. Just leave you with the constitution with Wickard v. Filburn and say if you caught this, if you like this, please share it around. Please tell people that we are doing these kinds of things in virtual legality. Maybe I can click the button here fast enough. We're going to see a little bit behind the scenes here. Uh, but I want you to know, I really appreciate it. If you could like this, subscribe to it, share it with people that you think might be interested in these kinds of topics for whatever reason, either because we're talking about coronavirus a lot right now in this space uh, and YouTube doesn't like that regardless of the notices that they've given us to say that it's allowed and we get yellow flagged all the time. These videos aren't going out quite as much as they were earlier in the year. So please share it around, comment on this video, disagree with me. Talk to me about what some of your least favorite Supreme Court decisions might be, because I would love to actually have these kinds of light, frothy discussions about this important stuff more often. 
And if you've got one that you really don't like, chances are we will cover Corey Matsu at some point in time. So you don't need to include that one necessarily. But if you've got one that you really don't like that maybe I'm not even familiar with, hey, maybe I'll talk about it in virtual legality because this stuff is interesting. It's important, but it doesn't need to be this wholly difficult thing to grapple with. It governs our lives if you're a United States citizen or even if you're just a resident here in the country. So it's important to know this stuff. It's important to know how this forms the basis for our legal paradigm. But if I can make it a little bit more alive, a little bit more useful, I really want to do that. Otherwise, if you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you listen to it in its podcast format, thank you so much for listening. Please do leave a review wherever you're listening to it at. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. 